Hello, my name is Dr. Jane Rickard. I'm a lecturer in 17th century English literature in the School of English at the University of Leeds. And I have particular research interests in the relationship between literature and politics in the period. This is a lecture about genre, which is an absolutely crucial concept for the study of literature. All literary texts, like films and other cultural productions, belong to one or more genres or groups. The conventions of a particular genre provide a set of parameters within which a writer writes and a reader interprets. Even if we're not aware of it, we think in terms of genre all the time. In this lecture, we're going to explore what genre is and how it works through a series of literary examples. And we're going to think about how an understanding of genre can facilitate critical engagement with any given text. The word genre comes from the French and originally Latin word for kind or class. And only relatively recently has the word come to mean a literary type or kind. Most broadly, we use genre to refer to poetry, prose, and drama. But of course, these types can be subdivided further. So plays can be tragedies, comedies, histories, and so on. And these subdivisions can in turn be subdivided further. So tragedies can be, for example, revenge tragedies, love tragedies, domestic tragedies. Now, it's important to recognize that a genre is not simply a formula. When a genre does descend into becoming a series of formulaic, predictable, highly similar texts, we're likely to think of that as not a very good genre. So, instead of thinking of a genre as a formula, we might think about genre in the abstract as a kind of gene pool, and all of the literary works associated with that genre as a family. There are certain family resemblances between those texts, but they aren't all the same. Together, the texts that constitute the family at any given time create a set of parameters within which or against which the next writer who comes along can work. That writer can in turn add to or modify these parameters. Each new member of the family, in other words, changes the family. Let's take a specific example of how this works. Revenge tragedy was a genre very popular in Renaissance England. Early Renaissance plays, such as Thomas Kidd's The Spanish Tragedy, had popularized this as a genre with particular conventions, including the presence of a ghost, the the inclusion of a play within a play. Shakespeare's most famous contribution to this genre is, of course, Hamlet. Now, when Shakespeare set out to write a revenge tragedy, he had to enter into dialogue with earlier plays in the genre. He had to write something in some ways similar, otherwise it wouldn't be a revenge tragedy, but he also had to write something in some ways new, otherwise there'd be little point in writing. So Shakespeare does engage with the already established conventions of the genre. He does, for example, include a ghost and a play within the play. But he also modifies those conventions and adds to the genre by, for example, multiplying the number of characters seeking revenge. Where earlier plays had only included one such character, Shakespeare's Hamlet manages to include four. In this way, Hamlet both becomes part of the genre and changes the genre. Subsequent writers of revenge tragedy then had to engage not only with the earlier plays, but also with Hamlet and find their own ways of doing something new and so on. What we're seeing then is that literary genres aren't static. Literary works, or at least what we might think of as good or important literary works, proceed by not simply following the conventions of a genre, but changing or subverting those conventions. With this in mind, we can see connections 
not only between works written in the same period and country, as with Renaissance revenge plays, but also between works written far apart in space and time. We might, for example, look at Sophocles' Oedipus Rex, written in ancient Greece, Shakespeare's King Lear, written in 17th century England, and Arthur Miller's Death of a Salesman, written in 20th century America, and say that all three are tragedies. Tragedy is not simple to define. There is no single defining feature, no one definition that would capture these three different texts. And yet, there are family resemblances. We could trace genealogies, and we can see changes across the generations. So, for example, we might find Arthur Miller's concerns very different from those of Shakespeare, but we can recognise that issues of capitalism had as much tragic potential for Miller as issues of kingship did for Shakespeare. A genre changes and develops then, as each writer brings his or her concerns to bear, as each writer puts his or her stamp upon it. Genres also change through what, continuing the family metaphor, we might refer to as cross-breeding. In other words, elements of two different genres might be combined to produce a third new genre. This kind of generic mingling is something about which Shakespeare, for example, was highly self-conscious, as we can see by returning to Hamlet. The travelling players have just arrived in Elsinore, and Polonius refers to them as the best actors in the world, either for tragedy, comedy, history, pastoral. Pastoral, comical, historical, pastoral, tragical, historical. Tragical, comical, historical, pastoral. This is obviously a comic speech. Polonius is made to seem a rather ridiculous figure here. But what his speech also reflects upon is how different genres can merge or run into each other. Shakespeare himself brought different genres together. In his late play, The Winter's Tale, for example, he combines elements of tragedy with elements of comedy to produce a work sometimes categorised as tragicomedy, a composite kind of genre. What the line Shakespeare gives Polonius also remind us of, however, is that classifying literary works according to genre can be difficult. Some literary works resist easy classification or seem to belong to more than one genre at the same time. And sometimes it's not easy to say what it is that constitutes a given genre, what it is, for example, that makes tragedy tragic. Genre is then complex and often elusive, but it is a fundamental aspect of literary production and, as we'll consider next, of literary interpretation.